Welcome back to New World Next Week. I'm James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. And I'm James Evan Pilato of MediaMonarchy.com, billionaire, builder, burger, busted, building bioweapons. We've got that story, plus DARPA wants GMO Venus spy traps. But first, the new Cold War rages on. The Russian government will build an independent internet for use by itself. Plus Brazil, India, China, and South Africa, the other so-called BRICS nation, in the event of global internet malfunctions, so reports the recently de-googled Russian news site RT. More precisely, Moscow intends to create an alternative to the global domain name system, or DNS, the directory that helps the browser on your computer or smartphone connect to the website server or other computer that you're trying to reach. The Russians cited the ever-popular national security concerns, but the real reason may have more to do with Moscow's own plans for offensive cyber operations. And the majority of this article from Defense One is pretty much spent on describing why the Ruskies are evil psychopaths for wanting to maybe build their own internet. Russian President Vladimir Putin has set a date of August 1st, 2018 to complete the alternative DNS. In a statement, Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov framed Russia's desire for an alternative DNS as essential to protecting it from possible external influence. There is a deep irony in Russia citing the increased capabilities of Western nations doing attacks in the informational space. It is like the fake social media account of the pot calling the kettle fake, so said technologist Peter Singer, the war-loving American who helps run the New America Foundation and is a contributing editor for popular science, not to be confused with Australian eugenicist slash nutball Peter Singer. James, Russian internet, here we go. Yes. Well, OK, so that's the uh, the grabby headline. But the reality is this is not an entirely alternate internet structure or anything. This is alternate DNS system that they're creating, domain name system. And it's often described as like a phone book for the internet. So when you type in CorbettReport.com, what is in fact is happening is you're uh, contacting a DNS, which is resolving uh, that string of letters into a string of numbers, which is the actual address for the server. And it is, so the idea is that censorship can come along in the form of the U.S. government or some other government agency coming along and saying, okay, well, we're going to take that that uh, address out of the phone address book, as it were, the internet address book, and we're going to put in, you know, this address, so you'll get directed over here, and it'll say, we're the FBI, and we don't want you going to this website, or whatever. That's a way of doing censorship. So, the Russians are saying, well, why would we have this DNS system that can so easily be hacked? We're going to create our own. Um, th so this is what's really going on. So uh, it's not exactly an entirely alternate inter internet structure. And perhaps the more fundamental underlying point of this is that, yes, DNS is a vulnerability and a stupid one, really, because in essence, it really is just a, a phone book that's just directing people to various servers. Uh, why don't we do it ourselves? Why do why on earth are we relying on you know ISPs to be using these DNS systems that are easily controllable and censorable when we can do it ourselves? And there are many alternate ways of doing this that are already in place and many more coming in the near future. There's Open NIC uh, for people who are interested in open and democratic alternative DNS route. Um, but there's uh, more importantly, there's uh, decentralized DNSs that are coming into view with uh, various crypto um, uh, cryptocurrency well it's not currency but crypto ideas um, blockchain DNS uh, I've talked about dot bit before which is on the name coin um, coin <laughs> crypto coin uh, with uh, Michael Dean of freedom fiends uh, you can go back in the archives for that conversation uh, if you want some more of the technical ins and outs of this you can go to a, uh, a post on medium from last year called the case for decentralized dns so the idea is yes i mean i think ultimately everyone needs to be getting out of the under the thumb from this this potential dns censorship and the technology for doing that is already here it's just a question of people being motivated enough to seek out these alternate things and and uh, doing a little bit of the yeah it's going to take a little bit of reading and a little bit of know-how to figure out how to reconfigure um you know, how to configure yourself around this problem, but it's doable. So it shouldn't be Russia or the BRICS nations doing this as a regional thing for everyone. It should be people coming together to do this in a decentralized fashion, like with pretty much every other problem we talk about. <laughs> and this story, I think, has lots of other tentacles that could connect out to lots of other stories I think we could talk about this week. Of course, like your recent interview with Jeffrey Tucker, destroying the notion of net neutrality. 
And in other news, and speaking, I think, of fake kettles, James, you were tweeting and we're talking about censorship and we're talking about the Russian boogeyman and all these sorts of smoke and mirror operations. You tweeted recently, fake news CNN begs the public to stop calling their fake news fake news. And this via the fake news CNN. And I don't know if you noticed, it was stealthily filed under their opinion page. But if you go to that page, and of course, we'll include that link for you, it also features an embedded video with news from the TV channel. So the biggest LOL I found in this opinion piece, quote, increasingly the term fake news has become weaponized by politicians who use it to undermine independent journalism in an effort to reach the public directly through their own channels. It's funny, I don't really recall that many politicians speaking out against independent media. It seems, again, like classic misdirection and in an extra just kind of big escalation. The New York Times editorial board, again, opinions, editorials, they're called op-eds for a reason. The New York Times editorial board today tells readers to call their senators here in the States to oppose the GOP tax slash theft bill. In other news, the Br'er Rabbit begs, please don't throw me into the briar patch. Our second story on this New World Next Week, episode 329. For November 30th, 2017, takes us to our good friends at Blacklisted News with a really, really strange story that I discussed a little bit on my morning show this morning. Vaccine company caught illegally injecting people at hotels with herpes. And wait till you get to the, if I may call it, the punchline of this story. And we get this from our friends at Blacklisted News and originally from, again, the awful RT. A U.S. researcher aiming to develop a herpes vaccine conducted illegal trials during which he injected people in hotel rooms in the U.S. near the Southern Illinois University and even at a house on the island of St. Kitts, which is in the West Indies. William Halford was his name. A former associate professor at Southern Illinois University began his first trial in 2013, but the setting wasn't a university lab or a room at a hospital. It was a Holiday Inn Express and a Crown Plaza Hotel 15 minutes away from Southern Illinois University. Halford, who died this year, June 2017, of cancer, administered his experimental shots to at least eight herpes patients on four different occasions in the summer and fall of 2013. The volunteers, they were volunteers, injected with a virus he had created. Now, Halford, who was a microbiologist rather than a physician, apparently knew his makeshift trial was a violation of U.S. law, which probably shows why they went literally offshore. As he stated the need for secrecy in one of his emails, he said it would be suicide if it became too public about how he was conducting his research. The university previously said it had no role, responsibility, or knowledge of the 2016 trial on St. Kitts because Halford pursued it through Rational Vaccines, a company he co-founded in 2015. Its sole purpose was to market and research the herpes vaccine. So the question then is, where did this mad scientist get all the money to do these crazy things? Entrepreneur and PayPal co-founder Peter Thiel invested millions of dollars into the research in April of 2017. James, we've got some interesting related stories. Of course, this, this won't be the first time we've discussed Peter Thiel. And you said this was new news to you. So you haven't had too long to kind of stew on this story. And even as we were starting to roll, I think both of you and I are both just like, good Lord. Yeah. I mean, it's such a bizarre story in so many different ways, um, but uh, that it traces back to Bilderberger Peter Thiel, perhaps not surprising, very worrying, but at any rate, um, extremely interesting. So I think there are a lot of threads in that story that you and or I will, and hopefully other people out there will have to pursue in further follow up to this story. But uh, it does bring to my mind the examples that we've talked about in the past of, yeah, this is an example of some sort of big pharma operation that's being conducted through some sort of cutout. Oh, it's through my rational vaccines company. You know, it's not part of this real program, blah, blah, blah. Um, that's all very interesting. But there have been real U.S. governmental programs that have used experimental vaccines. I mean, obviously, most obviously in the military, where, of course, the troops are shot up with whatever experimental vaccines they've got going because they are the guinea pigs on the front line. But uh, more ominously, even, uh, to unsuspecting citizens in various trials. And we've, of course, talked about uh, the Tuskegee experiments and things like that in the past. But uh, people might remember seven years ago, the U.S. government was apologizing for their Guatemalan STD experiment, where they were uh, shooting up uh, pa uh, 
patients in hospitals and prisoners and prostitutes with syphilis and gonorrhea without their consent in the 1940s. And of course, they come along, you know, half a century later. Oops, sorry, did we do that? And we did talk about that on uh, New World Next Week back several years ago. So I'll throw in a link to that flashback. But uh, if you are interested in how deep that particular rabbit hole goes, I did write an article eight years ago now, Governments and Biowarfare, A Brief History, that goes through just a few examples of this throughout the different decades in the 1930s and 50s and 60s and 90s, going up to the uh, um, 1,500 six-month-old black and Hispanic babies in L.A. given experimental measles vaccines that had never been licensed for use in the U.S., and the CDC later admitted that their parents were never informed that the vaccine being injected into their children was experimental. Things like that, that Go down the memory hole. Uh, Most people probably don't remember the stories like that, but they are there, and there are many, 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 many examples of that. And to think that that isn't still going on today would be naive at best. Whether it's going on through the auspices of one of these, you know, rational vaccine company cutouts or through the U.S. government directly, uh, it's happened in both ways many times in the past. So Bilderberger, PayPal founder Peter Thiel funding offshore herpes vaccine trials We'll include that in the show notes and the reminder of previous times that we've mentioned Peter Thiel on New World next week, like on January 14th, 2016, where we talked about one of his companies, Palantir, the, the secret weapon in the War of Terror. Our third and final story this week on New World next week, of course, and maybe some ways our, our last story, I don't know, James, I was going to say our last story is the weird stories, but I, I think the second one might be tough to top, but let's let's see if I can do it. This story comes via Venominous course, a pseudonym, who wrote this article and also shared it using hashtag New World Next Week. DARPA wants GMO plants as battlefield surveillance. The Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, DARPA, wants to genetically engineer plant-based sensors to be used as battlefield surveillance technology. DARPA, if you don't know, reports to the Department of Defense and is responsible for researching and developing technology that can be used for the U.S. military, you know, like the Internet. DARPA's Biotechnologies Office, BTO, is taking care of business, announced earlier this month a Proposer's Day, Proposer's Day, sounds sounds so loving, for the newly created Advanced Plant Technologies, APT program. Quote, the program will pursue technologies to engineer robust plant-based sensors that are self-sustaining in their environment and can be remotely monitored using existing hardware. End quote, the agency's plan is to develop plants that can detect the presence of certain chemicals, pathogens, radiation, and even electromagnetic signals. So right now it's unclear what plants they will use to make their spies. The writer suggests maybe Virginia Creeper, or he even coins the name Venus Spy Trap. DARPA will be hearing research proposals for the program on December 12th in a straight-up thug town called Arlington, Virginia. James, strange. Straight up thug town. That's a good way of putting it. Yes, indeed, Arlington. Um, Well, yes, a very interesting story, and I don't know the specifics of these plant-based sensors or how far advanced they are with this idea or whether it's just a blue sky kind of thing. Because we have to keep in mind when it comes to DARPA, a lot of these kind of attention-grabbing sort of sounding proposals are floated out there. And I think some of them are just to make the public go, wow, are they working on that? And... Uh, meanwhile, they're working on their real stuff, you know, in the in the secrecy of the uh, the skunk works there that no, you know we don't get to find out about until much later. So I don't know, you know, which which one of those stories this is. But on that note, I would encourage people to check out Corbett Report Radio two six five that I did back in two thousand twelve, DARPA Exposed, where I went through some of those crazy sounding ideas that they floated out there in the past to get the headlines like their their gay bomb idea we'll drop a bomb on people and make them gay so that they'll start you know making love to each other rather than making war yay things like this that are clearly just designed to grab headlines versus the things that they're really working on with the darpa robots and the smart dust and all that kind of stuff so we'll see which uh, category this falls into but at any rate it is worth it is absolutely worth keeping our eye on darpa and some of the things that are coming out of there and trying to dig up some of this stuff because uh, clearly, uh, you know, this is going to be the warfare of the future one way or another. It's just a question of uh, exactly which of these technologies they're throwing out as red meat to keep people like us spinning, chasing our tails and how much of it is, you know, what they're really working on. A related story I'll include, James, is another one I talked about on my morning show this morning, and it's a follow-up to something we've talked about quite a bit here, and that's CRISPR. 
It comes from Scientific American. Mail order CRISPR kits allow absolutely anyone to hack DNA. What could possibly go right? And we are definitely in need of a little bit of good news. I have the latest episode of my own good news next week. Trading desk jobs for corn cobs. Young Americans in record numbers are leaving their desk jobs for farmlands. Meanwhile, California might decriminalize magic mushrooms and Detroit. And I feel like, James, this kind of brings us full circle. Detroit is building community by building their own local Internet. See, it's not just crazy Russian oligarchs that want to build their own internet. It's underserved communities all around the world. So, James, and closing here, I think maybe if people are wondering about, you know, there's all the breaking news, there's Matt Lauer, there's all these, you know, pedogate stories. If people are looking for the latest in those kind of stories, the entertainment industrial complex kind of meltdown, I might recommend my own site and stream mediamonarchy.com slash listen. And as you might know, I put a lot of media in the monarchy straight up thug town called Arlington. That's a line from a song by a guy named Remy, who you might know who makes satirical songs. He seems like he mostly makes them now for the website Reason. So maybe we'll include some of that as well as, you know, you could, could definitely file that under some truth music. So MediaMonarchy.com slash listen is streaming live daily with news and music and memes and more. If you're into that sort of thing, we are independent, non-commercial alternative media, James. And I'll just wrap it up by asking folks to support our independent work. Indeed. And uh, this was a pretty crazy week of crazy stories. So let's see what we can dig up for next week. Looking forward to it, James. All right, man. Thanks.